uh, Lord, to worship you. Father, that's what we're here for. And so, Father, our lives are supposed to be lives of worship. And, Father, this is certainly a key part of that. So I pray, Father, this morning that uh, you would be glorified by our services. Now, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go ahead and do testimonies. God did something for you this week. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe. Yes, sir. I'm not sure if this right is credited to God, but since he holds me in his hand, I feel that I don't care to credit everything to God. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I... Oh, that was quick. Uh... Yeah. Last year was insane trying to get returns back for a lot of people. Uh, so I know well, people that. Well, I think that's because they still have money in the account. Uh, <laughs> it's just my opinion. Uh, but I think that the people who get their refunds quick, it's because the IRS still has money in the account. And then the people who don't get it, it's because the IRS is still waiting for taxes from this year to pay to the people for, na- for last year. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so go ahead, Mom. Yeah, you want to know why? Because businesses paid for it. That's really what happened. <laughs> so they borrowed a bunch of extra money for unemployment. Uh, that's what that stimulus check comes out of, is that big unemployment stuff. Uh, they borrowed, California borrowed a be- bunch of extra money, and then they told all the businesses, so you're going to pay X amount for this. My business paid for it. It was only like 47 bucks for me, but uh, but yeah, that's what the, I was like, what is this? <laughs> They're like, yeah, what's great is, what's really great about it is, you feel so good when you don't get to vote on something and it just gets automatically taken out. Ah, ah, it's nothing better. Uh, (laughs) Telling you what, I think we do need another tea party. But anyways, uh, (laughs) so I don't, I think it's so convoluted now. I don't think you could sort it out if you wanted to. Uh, Yes. (laughs) Honestly, I think the only solution to the whole thing is a flat tax. Everybody pays X amount when you buy something. Uh, I think that would end it. Uh, So, but anyways. uh, Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Al. Oh, Victoria came down and we got to see her. Yeah. Um, Playing an electric for here, too. I was like, wait, did we get this uh, <laughs> all right, anybody else before we move on? Go ahead, Ethan. You haven't even interviewed with me yet. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, Scott, he's been a co op. When the guy here left him, he moved up to 100 a month. Oh, so Cal Gas? Mine went up, mine has tripled since January. Yeah. Yes. Insane. Uh, yes. yeah. Mine, jumped, mine jumped right after the first of the year, it doubled, and then this last month, it doubled again. Makes you want to smack somebody. <laughs> that they expect us to believe the stuff they're telling us. Uh, I'm like, who are you guys talking to? Because you, you obviously aren't talking to anybody that's got a half a brain in their head. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, you know what I did? I did the same thing every other business owner did. I just tripled my prices. <laughs> So I did. <laughs> but that is exactly what happens. The guy, everybody thinks that they're going to get that. The, wow, we need to tax these companies more. Good luck. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> not going to work the way you think it's going to. Why do you think you price your eggs went up? Uh, the FDA has been shutting down egg farms because of the bird flu. 
They do it all the time. That's exactly what happens. It spikes your egg price. They go, oh, well, we can't, our profit can't suffer because of this. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it uh, makes, uh, makes for interesting times. Makes you, it doesn't make you happy that you're saved. Man, yeah. none of this stuff matters really ultimately. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. I'm just I'm happy that the price of trucks is coming down because I gotta buy a truck pretty soon here. So could they buy potential for the and then all of them not Like they had to buy them for the hat, so they are they are they they're gonna start an egg farm. Well, yeah, so they could, like she bought, she was telling me about it, they got, they're going to get the tubes because I said, I was That's probably how Russell Anderson got started, though. Well, that's what Russell Anderson, Russell Anderson was eggs, right? Wasn't Russell Anderson eggs? Uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, pretty sure he was an egg farmer. Uh, so. Well, I won't lie. If we have a large farmer, I think he's going to that guy is a multimillionaire. He started what? three different Bible colleges. Yeah, well, I got, I got somebody for that. So. There we go. <laughs> Who's got uh, Mike? Oh, no. chicken drink Mike, but I got a guy. I know a guy. So. I thought you said she has to do that. It ain't free. We have Scott. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> I know you did not say that. <laughs> All right. All right, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and stand. Take your song. Turn to page number 468. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I paid for it already. Uh, <laughs> oh, I guess I should move this slide forward, huh? There we go. Here we go on the first. Without him, I could do nothing. Without him, I surely fail. Without him, I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? You can't turn him away. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. Without him, I would be dying. Without him, I'd be enslaved. Without him, life would be hopeless. But with Jesus, thank God, I'm saved. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? You can turn him away. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. That's exactly how it goes. I know. Uh, all right. <laughs> Take your song, Victor, to page number 200. Uh, <laughs> Want to bet? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it does run right off. Huh. All right, here we go. Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is bright, making the sorrowing glad. Make me a blessing. Make me a 
blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. Tell the sweet story of Christ and His love. Tell of His power to forgive. Others will trust Him if only you prove true every moment you live. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O oh, Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. Give as was given to you in your need. Master, love you. Be to the helpless a helper indeed, unto your mission be true. Make me a blessing, make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O oh, Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. All right, go ahead and be seated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Allison loved that one. That's it right there. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go ahead and do prayer requests. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Go ahead, Mom. Somebody else. Go ahead, Matt. Monday. Yep, that's right. What, Brian? Five, four, so three, two. No, no, Clayton did not say. Okay, let me let you know. Right, this is a question. Because <laughs> I already know what you're going to say. Right. So, let's pray for a day. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that, yeah. Anyways, all right. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead. We're going to go ahead and take offering. Ladies, there will be no Bible study Tuesday night because it is Valentine's Day. 
your husbands are supposed to be taking you out somewhere expensive. Uh, <laughs> so, actually, I gotta wait. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good old Hallmark, right? All right, let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we love you. We are thankful, God, for the opportunity, Lord, to give. We really are. Uh, Lord, uh, you are you're good to us, Father, beyond all that we could ever deserve, God. And Lord, uh, I pray that we'd give uh, today in such a way, God, that you'd be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
go the extra mile Just like a mother caring for her child Friend who'll stick through thick and thin No matter what you've done or where you've been Just like one great big family A stronger older brother he will be So quick and ready to defend the younger weaker to the end and he's ever interceding to the father for his children yes he's ever interceding to the like some sheep we'd gone astray struggling beneath the blood we could not pay never hoping to renew the love and fellowship that we once knew but he began to intercede <clears throat> crying father please forgive I plead and as the nails pierced in his head God once again reached out to men and he's ever interceding to the father for his children He's ever interceding to the Father for his own. Through him you can reach the Father. So bring him all your happy burdens. Yes, he's ever interceding. So come boldly to the throne and he's ever interceding to the father for his children yes he's ever interceding father for his own through him you can reach the father Baby. All right, let's go ahead and stand one more time and uh, see if we can labor through this one. This one should be a little bit easier. This is an easier melody, so. Uh, just put it back there, yeah. Actually, I don't know. Is it? Yeah, it must be. <laughs> uh, the name of the publishing company is Love and War. Uh, That's funny because the music is published by City of Light Music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if I 
Gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my fast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yeah, let's try that again. Here we go. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released, I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, with every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, till my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, Still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. All right, go ahead and be seated. We'll yeah, probably. So we'll do that one a few more times. I like that one. Uh, so, all right, let's go ahead and take our Bibles. Turn to John chapter 13, John chapter 13, verse number 35. John chapter 13 and verse number 35 is where we're going to start. Uh, we have been, uh, there's no greater call uh, in the life of the believer, right, or to the world really, but no greater call in the life of the believer than to love, right? And we talked uh, last week a little bit about it. This week we're going to talk about loving others. Last week we talked about self-sacrificial love. We're going to pick up kind of right on the tail end of what we were talking about last week. Uh, and then expand that into uh, into loving others, right? The, to love the way that God loves uh, is to be self-sacrificial, uh, right, in the way that you love. And so um, 
basically there's three uh, words used in the New Testament uh, for love. And that is eros, uh, which is intimate love. Um, and uh, then there is philio, uh, right, which is like friendship love, right? It's where you get the word Philadelphia from. Eros was, is uh, intimate uh, in the way that a husband and a wife love each other, uh, right? And so that's, uh, that's where you get that kind of love from. And then uh, there's agape love. They're interchangeable often, and so don't put too much stock in, uh, right, going back to the Greek uh, to try to define what a passage means too much, uh, because a lot of times you're, you're running down a rabbit hole that uh, is going to end up in the same place that it started. Uh, and so uh, sometimes, sometimes people get too tied up with, uh, wow, you know, the Greek, in the Greek it says, most of the time that's just a way for a guy to tell you that he's educated. Um, and so at least that's what he's, it's, it's what he wants you to believe anyways when he says that. So uh, there's a reason why it's translated into English, and the translators that translated these words into English were far more intelligent uh, than any of your scholars today. Uh, you're talking about individuals that actually spoke uh, Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew uh, fluently. These are guys that that's what they spent their summers doing, was just learning different languages for the fun of it. Uh, <laughs> right? And so... Uh, they're uh, they're different breed than the type of scholars that we have today. Anyway, so uh, so when you hear people say uh, things like, "Well, you know, uh, this would be better," this would be better translated. No, it wouldn't. Never would it be better translated. Uh, this, that, or the other. Right? The King James translators translated it exactly as it should be, um, and the words that they use have far fuller meaning than trying to narrow it down. Sometimes, sometimes. Uh, in newer translations, they will narrow a word down to the point that it has no meaning, uh, almost uh, in the context of the passage. But anyways, uh, that's kind of here nor there. But uh, that was not uh, not intended to be the the introduction. But uh, but we are called to love others, right? Uh, and uh, we're in John chapter thirteen here, uh, and verse number thirty five. We're going to read these two verses together. If you've got your Bible, I'll have it on the slide here in a minute. But um, the Bible says in verse number 34, he says, a new commandment, this is obviously Jesus speaking, you know how you know, because it's in red letters. No, uh, <laughs> but uh, if you read the context, you know, right, that it's Jesus speaking, right? So, um, but anyway, so a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. Right? So, this is Christ. This is shortly before Christ is going to Christ is going to die on the cross. Real quick here, um, right? In fact, you can see that in verse thirty-eight. This is when Christ tells Peter, "You, you think you can go all the way, but you're not going to, right? You're going to deny me, uh, right?" And so, so this is right before Christ goes to the cross. Uh, so these words have some weight to the disciples who will become the apostles, but to the disciples here, right? Um, these really mean something, and they should mean something to us. The other thing is, is the love that he's talking about in verse 35 is defined by verse 34, right? So he's not talking about just friendship type of love, right? High five, you know, we're buddies, we're pals, um, right? That's not the type of love that he's talking about. He's talking about self-sacrificial love because he's telling them, you need to love like I've loved you, and in just a few moments he's going he's gonna to show the ultimate example of that love. Right by dying on the cross, and so, uh, so that's the type of love that we're supposed to have uh, for others, right? Certainly for other believers, uh, uh, for sure. And so, we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. So, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll jump into this. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for your word, God. I pray, Lord, I'd say exactly what I should say. Pray I'd not say anything I shouldn't, Father. I pray I'd stay within the boundaries of Scripture, God. Um, Lord, that I'd not get in the way of your word. Uh, Lord, and that you'd be glorified this morning, I pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we talked last week about the fact that love is the greatest, it's the greatest call is to love. There's no, there's no greater call in the world than to, than to love, and certainly no greater call in the world than to love others uh, as we should. And so the reason that love is the greatest call of all, uh, where we ended last week, is because God is love, right? Uh, scripture tells you that. Uh, that God is love. And so it doesn't tell you that God loves. It tells you it's a, that's what He is. It's His very nature. 
All right, it's his DNA uh, is love. And so uh, there's some reasons that we don't see more fruit from the way that we love. And we talked a little bit about that as we closed last week. Uh, two reasons I don't think we see more fruit from loving others the way that we should love others, or the reason that we don't love others the way that we should love others, is because, number one, because we don't understand what showing the love of God really is. Uh, and so we tack these things, we tack our own understanding onto what it means to love uh, others. And then, uh, and then, of course, we, sometimes we go beyond right what God's called us to do, and we say, I can't ever love people like that. Or uh, we don't love people to the degree that God's called us to love them. And so we don't see the fruit from loving others like we should see the fruit from loving others because we don't understand it. And then because we're afraid, right? We're, we're afraid of loving others. Uh, and we're afraid of loving others because we don't understand uh, because of point one, right? We don't understand it. So, uh, so we're afraid to actually engage, right? Uh, and so, listen, the fact is, love, the very nature of love is that it's self, it is selfless. That is what love is. It's self-sacrificing uh, to love another person. If you're not willing to be self-sacrificing, you really can't love somebody else. You can like them, maybe, uh, but you don't love them. If you're not willing to sacrifice for them, you really don't love them, uh, right? You may care about them. You may have empathy for them or sympathy for them, uh, but love is a whole nother ball ballgame, right? So uh, it's one of the reasons, the lack of love that we have in our lives as believers is one of the reasons that our faith is not as effective as it should be because the Bible tells us that our faith, right? We talked about last week, faith is powered by love. Uh, and so... Uh, our faith fails often because we don't love. Faith doesn't work without, without self-sacrificial love. It's dependent on it in order to work. Uh, and so, listen, the, the reality is, right, the, the conclusion we came to last week was this. You can't treat people bad, right, and then think your faith is going to reach out and touch the blessings of God. It's just not going to work that way. Right? You can't treat people in this world like garbage and then think, well, yeah, but that's okay because I'm a Christian and they're not. Right? So it's okay for me to treat people like they're garbage because you know, they, they don't understand you know, the, that I, the things that I believe in this kind of stuff. Listen, there's a lot of, a lot of hateful things that go around uh, out of the Christian world and into right, the secular world. There's an awful lot of that. Uh, I don't think there's as much as news media and such would have you to believe, right? They want you to believe that everybody's a Westboro Baptist, you know, uh, standing on the street with signs saying God hates fags and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. That's Christianity is really not that way. Uh, and it's never been that way. Uh, I've been in this thing my whole life, man. Uh, right? I've been in church my whole life. I've never experienced... Uh, I, I've met some Christians that are a little nutty, right? Uh, the type that would tell you, you know, well, bless God, you better trust Jesus now or you're going to split hell wide open with your forehead, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, I don't know who you think you're reaching, but, you know, we're told to reach people with the love of God. Uh, and here he tells you, ultimately, you know how people tell whether you're a believer or not? They don't tell by how big the Bible you carry is. And they don't tell by your doctrinal statement. Because most people will never see you carry your Bible, especially nowadays. They're all on our phones, iPads, and everything else, right? Uh, most people will never see you carry your Bible. Most people will never ask you what your doctrinal statement is. You know what most people in this world pay attention to? How you treat them. And this world knows how Christians ought to act, and they know how you ought to treat people. Right? Now, they'll, they'll, they'll use false dichotomies like telling you, well, the Bible says, judge not thee, be not judged. That is not what that verse is talking about. By any stretch of the imagination is that saying that, there's, that you are not allowed to judge anything ever because other places it tells you, you that the righteous judge everything, right? Spiritual man judges everything, uh, right? But, he's, but when it talks about uh, judging everything, it's also not talking about sitting on the uh, man sitting in front right, of a judge. It's not talking about sitting up there on the... Uh, on the throne and pounding the gavel. 
telling you the, the, the spiritual man, he's discerning, right? Pays attention to what's going on. Uh, but we as Christians, we ought to love people. Listen, uh, love is, uh, is how people know you're a Christian, according to John chapter 13, verse 35 here. It's exactly what he tells them here. Love's how people know you're a Christian. It's not the fish on your car. It's not the signs and wonders you wish you could do, right? Slap people in the forehead. Now they know you're a Christian, right? Uh, in other, uh, in other uh, church practices, right? People speak in tongues and all kinds of stuff like that, and they think that's how people know they're Christians. Man, people don't know you're a Christian because you do, even if you could do signs and wonders, they wouldn't prove you were a Christian. I can prove it to you, by the way. I'm going to prove that I want to prove that you're a Christian. Moses laid his rod down and turned into a snake. And you know what all the magicians in Egypt did? The exact same thing. Signs and wonder doesn't prove you're a Christian. Uh, right? It's not the dreams and visions of heaven we have. It's not your history of growing up in the church. It's not your ability to, sp to speak Christianese. Right? Some of us think as long... Listen, people know I'm a Christian just by the way that I talk. I'll say things like this. Oh, bless God. Right? Hallelujah. Amen. Now people know I'm a Christian. And that's not how people tell whether you're a Christian. Uh, right? It's not spiritual gifts that we wish we had. Uh, right? It's not, the, it's not having emotional experiences in church or otherwise. It's not, it's not even our exceptional faith. It's that, one, that, that beginning, that number one fruit of the Spirit, love. It's our love, one for another. That's how people know you're a Christian. It's not popular in today's, uh, in today's Christianity to say these kinds of things because, uh, well, we all know better, right? Uh, man, we're in a war. We're in an all-out assault, man. We need, a, we, we need a storm, man, Washington and all this other kind of stuff. Man, listen, you want to change what's going on in the United States of America. You know how you're going to change it? One individual at a time. If you got everybody to vote the way you wanted them to vote, you know you'd find out the candidate you're voting for isn't nearly as spiritual as you think they are. Uh, listen, you can't uh, you can't self-sacrificially love somebody without that love originating with God. It's not in us as human beings to self-sacrificially love other people. Uh, and here's what uh, some of us are confused by that, right? And the reason is we're trying to apply human love to, a, to, the, to an inhuman ability to love. It is, listen, it's not now we say, well, yeah, but I know lots of stories of people who have sacrificed themselves, thrown themselves on a grenade or got shot for somebody else and all this other kind of stuff. Listen, there's a big difference between duty and love. Listen, love's a whole other ball game. To self-sacrificially love somebody is a very difficult thing to do. If you have anybody in your life that you have self-sacrificially loved, you know it's hard to do. Because sometimes they make you scream. <laughs> right? You wish you could strangle them in Jesus' name. Uh... But the reality is, right, it's hard to self-sacrificially love somebody. Uh, listen, what we're doing is we're, we're adding three to three and expecting to get nine, and that's not the way it works. Right? God's got to be a part of this. Listen, human love uh, can't, uh, can't self-sacrificially love somebody else. You're not going to show the world that you're His disciples, Right? by loving the world the way the world loves you. Just not going to work. And too many Christians, right? Too many of us, me included, right? We get this idea in our head, I'll treat them like they treat me. I'll love them like they love me. We think, we, we hear these phrases like, you got to fight fire with fire. That's a dumb idea. Go ahead, go down to the fire station and just ask. So how do you guys fight fire? You guys just load the truck up with gasoline and just fire with fire, baby. 
Listen, I understand the way that forest fires are fought. I understand the concept of burn back. I get it. But they don't start on the other side of the forest. Sometimes as Christians, we think that if we will just treat the world like the world treats us, right? Equal. We want to be on an equal footing with the world. Let me tell you something. You're never going to be on an equal footing with the world. There's never going to be more of us than there are of them. Scripture's told you that from a long time ago. Straight is the way, narrow is the gate that leadeth to life. Few there be that find it. There's never going to be more Christians than there is in the world. It's just the way that it is. And listen, we've got to, as Christians, we ought to be loving like God loves, right? It only works when we love the way that God loves. So how do you know the difference? Listen, human love receives the benefit. In fact, human love prioritizes its own benefit. It loves because of how, what am I going to get out of this? Tell me what I'm going to get out of this relationship. It's one of the problems that I have with all of the so-called relationship advice that's going around on social media, right? TikTok, Instagram, and all these other things. Got these guys over here with militant masculinity, right? And then you've got the feminists over here with militant feminism, right? And they're both saying, well, you know, I'm going to do this, and if you, you know, women are all like this, and men are all like that. And listen, all of that, all of that stuff is, uh, is looking out for old number one. It's what all this militant masculinity that you're hearing about in our present day and age is, right? What everybody wants to call toxic masculinity, right? And they try to apply that to a lot of things, and men go, well, we're not toxic, bless God. Well, uh, right? Listen, a lot of that type of masculinity, that's toxic, man. I don't know how else you want to phrase that. Saying, all that matters is me, what I want. That's all that matters. I don't have to be faithful to one woman. I don't have to be faithful in marriage. I don't have to be faithful in business. I can act however I want, do what I want, as long as I come out ahead. That's all that matters. If that's not toxic, I don't know what is. And by the way, it applies on the other side with women Right? And they get on and they say, well, you know, I can do whatever I want. Men, I'll sleep around so I can sleep around too. That's a great way to prove that, that toxic masculinity sucks is by acting exactly like them. We're, you're geniuses. It doesn't work. And that's the world that we live in. The problem is, is that, that the world's love always prioritizes itself. If you love somebody because of how it makes you feel, that's not positive. And it's certainly not biblical. That is not the love of God. Nowhere in Scripture are you ever going to find anywhere where Scripture tells you, hey, as long as people love you, you love them. No, in fact, what you're going to find is where it says, we love Him because He first loved us. Our job is supposed to be to love first. Not to wait and see how the world is. Not to wait and see how they treat us. Let me tell you something. If you're really a Christian, you're never going to be treated well by the world. The world doesn't like us. You know why they don't like us? Because they don't see themselves in us. They see something, and it's not because of the way that we act or because we're so pure and we're so good and we're so righteous. It's not that. It's because when they look at us, they see a reflection of Jesus Christ in us. And it's off-putting to somebody who doesn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. It's not because they see a perfect reflection, but it's because they can see hints of it. Uh, listen, self-sacrificing means that you're not getting the benefit. If we want to be a light in this world, then we need to treat people in this world with the love of God and expect nothing in, con- in return and love people with no conditions. It's what we're supposed to do. It's not because they deserved it, right? But because their life should be better for having come across our path. You didn't deserve the love of God. Get over yourself. If you think you deserve the love of God, boy, do you got another thing coming. He didn't die on the cross because man deserved it. He died on the cross because God the Father in heaven deserved it. 
Listen, we ought, to, we, we ought to love the way that He has loved us because love is the evidence you're saved. Look at this. Take your Bible, go to 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 14 real quick. 1 John 1, 14. He says, we know that we have passed from death unto life. Unto life. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, John 3, 14. <laughs> I said 1, 14, didn't I? I don't have my glasses on, it's my fault. Uh, if I stand back here, I can see it. It's 1 John 3, 14. Uh, <laughs> sorry. He says, we know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. You know what he says? You know how you know you're saved? You love other believers. That's how you know. And if you don't, he says, you're abiding in death. Uh, listen, notice this. He doesn't say we think. He doesn't say we think that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He says, he, he that loveth not his brother abideth, right, in death. He doesn't say we think that. He says we know it. It's a sure thing. It doesn't, this is, John's not saying, here's my opinion, guys. If you don't love each other, you're probably not saved. It's not his opinion. Right? This isn't his theory. Let me give you my theory on how to know whether you're saved or not. You ever met somebody that constantly doubts whether they're saved? Doubts whether they've trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior? You want to know what a... You, you, this is how you assure them. How do you feel about other believers? You not want to be around us? You don't want to be around us? Probably a spirit dwelling in you that doesn't want to be around us either. And I don't mean it like demon possession, to be clear talking about the human spirit, the human spirit is anti-God. The human spirit is not pro-God. Your natural man is not pro-God. He is anti-God. He wants to live in opposition to God. That's what Paul talks about when, uh, in Romans, right? Being carnal. It, he wants to live opposite of God. Uh, listen, this is how we know according to the Scripture. John said, we know we're saved because we love the brethren. He's obviously not talking about physically, physical death here when he says if you don't love them, you abide in death. He's obviously not talking about physical death because I know a lot of Christians who have died. You probably do too. So they obviously didn't escape death by loving, other, loving their brothers and sisters in Christ. But they did escape spiritual death, right? Or being separated from God ultimately. How do you know you've been united with God? The way you know you've been united to God, man, in this thing called salvation is His love now flows through us or through you and you love others because of it. Listen, we used to be known as believers, we used to be known as loving to a fault. In fact, we were known to be so loving that people thought we were doormats. In this present day Christianity of bow your back, puff out your chest, don't let anybody walk on you. If they slap you, slap them back. That type of Christianity didn't come out of the book. That's the philosophy of men. Scripture tells us the love of God flows through us. They slapped Jesus, he didn't slap them back. They pulled his beard out, he didn't pull theirs out. They cussed him, he didn't cuss them back. Listen, well, that type of love is supposed to be what flows through us now. You're born again. When you're born again, the Spirit of God moves in. And when the Spirit of God moves in, the love of God begins to flow in, your, in and through your heart. Why? Because you've taken on His nature. His very DNA is now a part of your DNA. And His DNA is what? God is love. Listen, the love of God, the, Paul puts it this way, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. That's the way Paul puts it. When you receive Christ, that's what happens. And if you don't love the brethren, then you are abiding in or you're staying in your dead state. 
You're living in the old man. Assuming you're a believer and you don't like other believers, right? Assuming that you actually have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you still don't like other, people, uh, other believers, you know what you've done? You've gone back and sat down in the cor- corpse of the old man and decided that's where you're going to live. You know, kind of like when Luke Skywalker cuts that big thing open and crawls inside, right? To stay warm. It's what you've decided to do. I'm just going to crawl back in here because I feel so much more comfortable in my old man. But you've been called out of that. We've passed from spiritual death to spiritual life. We don't have to look for it, right? We don't have to ask for it. We don't have to fast. We don't have to pray about whether we should love other people. We already have it. It's supposed to be a very part of our nature to love others because it's been shed abroad in our hearts. So here's the message, right? Why do you and I have such a hard time loving people? In fact, I would dare say we have a harder time loving other believers than we do even most people in the world. Most of the time we're very, we get loving people in the world. But loving fellow believers, well, he doesn't, he doesn't believe the same thing I believe. Uh, he doesn't like this guy, and I like this guy, and he doesn't like that, and I like that. And Man, we will, I've, <laughs> I think I said it last week, right? Christians, number one thing we're famous for, man, is shooting our own wounded. You let a Christian stumble and fall and end up in sin, man, and we will stab that guy in the back in two seconds. We'll kick him. We'll try and keep him down. My opinion is we try to keep him down because we're trying to make ourselves look better. At least I'm not as bad as that guy. I haven't done what that guy did. And if that guy gets back up and starts doing more for God than we are, and we've never been down where he's been, and now he's up, now he's doing more for God than we're doing, then it makes us look really bad for not doing more for God. So we'd rather just keep him down, stuff him in the, stuff him in the barrel, man. Don't let him out. Listen. I think there's a lot of reasons why we have a hard time loving other people. One is because we're looking to our flesh or we're looking to our intellect for a reason or a source for the love that we're supposed to have for other people. I'm looking for a reason to love them. Let me tell you something. You don't need a reason to love your brothers and sisters in Christ, period. Full stop. You don't need a reason. You sure don't need a reason to love the lost. People who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, people who are going to spend an eternity in hell, how could you not love them? You want to have some fun? Google Penn and Teller, uh, I think it's Teller, uh, who, man, he's got a whole clip on YouTube talking to Christians. He's an atheist, all out atheist. I mean, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a God hater for sure. But he says, even, he says, if I was a Christian and if I did believe that people were going to go to an eternal hell, I'd spend every waking minute trying to keep people out of it. He says, Christians who say they believe in this hell and never do anything to try to reach other people, I don't understand. He says, there's no possible way you guys believe that stuff. Listen, we don't love people because we think we need a reason because that's what the world tells you. The world tells you, protect yourself, guard your heart, don't get hurt, don't get stabbed in the back, everybody's out to get you, everybody's going to take advantage of you. They're right. That's what we're here for as Christians, to be taken advantage of. To show people the love of God. You realize more people have been reached for the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the sacrifice of martyrs in our past than because of us standing up, bowing our backs, and fighting back. Another wonderfully uh, uh, unacceptable opinion in the present day and age. Listen, I can... Read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. See how many people became believers because they watched somebody else wrongfully tried, wrongfully accused, wrongfully convicted, wrongfully killed for the sake of the gospel. Listen, we're supposed to love others. God doesn't, uh, 
dwell in your flesh. It doesn't dwell in your feelings. He dwells in your spirit. He dwells in your soul. Listen, uh, God doesn't dwell in your intellect. You're never going to be able to make sense of loving others the way that God has loved you. Because it will never make sense. Tell me how much sense the gospel makes that God in heaven would send His only begotten Son to die on a cross for a bunch of rebellious, for, for His rebellious creation. Why wouldn't He have just wiped us off the map and started over? He did it in Noah's day. But He left Noah. Could have wiped us out completely. Started all over. He spoke us into man. Man, He spoke the world into being. Formed us out of dirt. You think He couldn't have started over? How much sense does the gospel make that God loved His creation so much that He sent His Son to die for it? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It doesn't make any sense, and it won't make any sense to you if you love the way that you're supposed to love. The love of God dwells in our hearts can only be accessed by way of faith. Listen, you're going to have to look deeper in your heart for the love of God. Sometimes you're going to have to have faith to love somebody, even though you're positive they're going to stab you in the back. Even though you're positive they're just using you. You're going to have to love them anyways. It takes faith to do that kind of thing. Listen, if you don't have that kind of love in your heart for people, John says, you don't have any evidence of your salvation. That's a fun one, isn't it? Listen, he says, how do you know you're saved? Because you love the brethren. In spite of what your head may tell you, in spite of what your flesh may say, you love the brethren. Listen, if you died... Were, were supernaturally resurrected from the dead, right? Would you let anybody tell you you weren't really dead? Or how about this? Let anybody tell you you're not really alive now. You were dead, you're dead then. You're not really alive now. No, you wouldn't let anybody tell you that kind of stuff, right? In the same way, there should be no argument. If you've been born again, you know that because you have the love of God shed abroad in your heart. You know it. You don't know it because you've been baptized. You don't know it because you belong to some church. You don't know it because you go to confession. You don't know it because you took communion. You know it because you love others like you're supposed to love them. That's how you know it. Love's the very first fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be in your heart. You can be born again. But listen, if you don't allow the love of God to control you, you're going to continue to walk in your flesh. You're going to continue to live a carnal life, and it's going to end in defeat. Sometimes we get this idea in our mind that being carnal is just the big ones, right? Just the big sins are carnal. But the little sins I do, like, you know, not loving others, that's not a big deal. All right, listen, I could get up here, I could preach against homosexuality, and some of y'all would, that's right, let them hit it, man. Right? Preach against alcohol, preach against smoking, preach against drugs, preach against adultery, preach against fornication. Man, and people go, yeah, that's right, boy, you shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, let me tell you something else you ought not be doing. You ought not be unloving either. There's one for the Big Ten. Listen, we're supposed to love others. 
Fact is, sometimes the areas that we feel the strongest and the most secure in are the areas that we're the most fleshly in. Here's what he says in Galatians chapter 5, right? Verse, uh, verse number 16 there. He says, This I say then, walk in the flesh, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of, of the flesh. Or I'm sorry, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, vari variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. He says, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. He says, if we live, uh, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. He tells you this. He says, you know what? He says, you can live in the Spirit and not walk in Him. People who say, well, you know, if you, don't, if you sin, you're not saved. No, you can live in the Spirit and not walk in the Spirit. You can live in the Spirit and walk in all of those things that He just mentioned up there. Drunkenness, reveling, adulteries, idolatries. But if you live in the Spirit and you walk in the Spirit, the, Spirit, the, the fruit of the Spirit is evident in your life. If you walk in the Spirit, you won't have to Try to love people. It'll come natural if you're walking in the Spirit. Listen, love is the very first thing listed, and he says of all these things, he says, you know what? There's no law against these things. You've never one time in all of your life, right? There's certainly no Old Testament law in Scripture against those things. Have you ever read in a law that says, you're only allowed to love so much? You go past this point, there's, that's just too much loving. You're only allowed to be so happy. You're only allowed to laugh for five minutes a day. Anything more than that is against law. There's no law against the fruit of the Spirit. Never written a single one. You know why? How are you going to write a law against something that you can't control? Listen. There's no, you can't do any of those things too much. You can't do any of the fruit of the Spirit so much that they become a sin. Let me tell you something, Christian. You've never loved the wrong person. You've never loved any person too much. Never happened. And I'm not talking about the world's skewed view of love. Well, you know, I know I'm married, but, we're, but I'm just in love with this guy at work. I'm just in love with this girl at work, you know. But, and it's love. That's not love. Love, and you know it, and he tells you that in the passage. He tells you, you have to crucify the affections and lusts of this, uh, of this flesh. That's an affection of the flesh. That's a lust. It's not love. The world defines the world as an open definition for love in our present day and age. To the point, I know you don't think it's coming, but remember you didn't think it was coming when they said that you were going to be able to love whoever you wanted. What's coming next is you're going to be allowed to love any species you want to. You're going to have people down at the courthouse marrying their mule. I'm telling you, it's coming. If you don't believe it, it's called harm-free. Harm-free love it means you can love any people of any age you want to love and any species you want to love. It's coming. That's not love the way the world defines it. But biblically, you can't love anybody too much. You can walk in the Spirit, which means that you can walk in the fruit of your born-again nature and love first and foremost. Listen, if you've been born again, being loving 
already resides within you. It's living in you. And if you're not loving and you are saved, you're holding it back. Now, you may be holding it back because you've gone through some kind of trauma in your life, right? Somebody did you dirty. Somebody stabbed you in the back. Maybe you watched your mom and dad who said that they loved each other get divorced and, and call each other all kinds of names. Maybe somebody who told you that they loved you abused you, right? Whether physically or sexually in some way. And so you've got some reservations about love. But I'm here to tell you that, listen, you'll ne you're never going to do wrong by loving somebody. There are people out there who will hurt you. I'm not telling you that if you love people that you'll, you're never going to suffer hurt. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you some people who say that they love you don't love you. They're fulfilling a lust or they're fulfilling a, a, an affection of the flesh and they will, they will do whatever they have to to fulfill that. But I'm telling you that, man, the love of God can overcome whatever has happened to you in your life. And loving others, listen, what, what somebody did to you is not a reason not to love other people. Our prayer should be this. Our prayer should be, Lord, help me love my brothers and sisters in Christ in such a way that the world sees the power of the love of God through me. You know what the world looks at the Christians and says? If you guys can't even get along, why would I join you? You guys are supposed to all be rooting for the same team. And you guys can't even get along. Let me tell you what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we shouldn't defend the faith. I'm not saying that we should accept whatever doctrine, right? We should all just stand together, hold hands, and sing, Kumbaya, my Lord. It's not what I'm talking about. I can tell you that, hey, look at what you're teaching somebody is biblically incorrect and still love you. But I should also say it in the spirit of love as well. As opposed to, bless God, I, I'll tell you what, you're just sending people straight to hell with that kind of stuff. Our, listen, our nature is not to be that way. We ought to be, the love of God should be seen in us. The world should look at us as believers and say, man, they can love the most unlovable people. How can they do that? How can you love somebody that stabbed you in the back? And how can you love somebody who took advantage of you? I remember uh, I was in Texas, Fort Worth one time, uh, Brother uh, Gray's church, Longview, right outside of Fort Worth, Longview, sorry, uh, and for a meeting and with, that he was having. And I remember him making this statement, stuck with me, stuck with me since. Right? He said, it amazes me. Right? It was a pastor's meeting, so it was all preachers. He said, it amazes me, the number of you guys sitting out there, all you preachers sitting out there. He says that every day you pray, God, please use me. God, please use me. God, please use me. And then you turn around and you talk to your buddy on the phone and say, man, these people are just using me. He says, yeah, they're using you. It's God is using you. And the same thing's true, Christian. Some of you sitting in here right now, you say, man, I wish God would use me. I wish, I wish God would use me to show people the love of God and all this kind of stuff. But then somebody stabbed you in the back and you got bent out of shape about it. And so now you guard everything with your life because you're never going to be done dirty again. How's that working for you? Have you been able to stop anybody from doing you dirty yet? I'll bet you you haven't. Tell you something, people are going to do you dirty whether you love them or not. So you may as well love them. We ought to love others. Certainly we ought to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, thank you for these people. Thank you for them being here this morning. I pray, God, I said exactly what I should have said. And I pray, God, I didn't say anything I shouldn't have. And I pray, God, you've been glorified by it now. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thanks for being with us. We'll see you to, tonight, actually. But I'm going to start that in about 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you.